morning, everyone. Um, thank you guys all so much for being here on this early morning. Um, I really appreciate it. My name is Ileana Smith, and I'm going to be talking with you today about aerospace engineering for computer scientists. And so what we're going to talk about today is we're going to look at some parallels between the two fields, and so look at some lessons learned from aerospace missions that we can apply to computer science projects. And then I also want to talk a little bit about some intersections between the two fields and some considerations for putting computers in space. So before we really get started, I just want to share a little bit about myself and talk to you about why I'm giving this talk today. And the main reason is that I am an aerospace engineer um, in training. Uh, I'm a sophomore at the University of Michigan. I'm studying aerospace engineering with a minor in computer science. Um, I'm also a member of the team that works on the NASA Calypso satellite at NASA Langley, and I spent a bit over a year working as a junior developer at Nimble Pros. Um, if you were here at CubMash about 10 years ago, you might remember Nimble Pros distributing some programming principles and practices calendars, um, and I'll be using some of the images from those in this presentation. So I want to thank them for letting me use those. Um, and with all that said, let's get started. So, we're going to start off with just a brief overview of some spaceflight history, just so that we're all on the same page and we have some context so that when we go deeper into some of the missions, we have a good understanding. Um, and we're focusing on American manned space flight because if we tried to go any broader than that, we'd be here all day. Um, and we're going to start off with Project Mercury. So Project Mercury, it's the beginning of the space race, and the goal at this point is to put the first person in space. And so Mercury wants to put the first person in space, and it wants to put the first person in orbit around the Earth. Um, they lost to the Soviets by 23 days on the first person in space, and by quite a bit more on the first person to orbit the Earth. But they did put the first American in space and the first American to orbit the Earth. So that was um, a success. And after that, they started looking towards the next phase of the space race, which is to put someone on the moon. And um, so Project Gemini, you are, what they're trying to do is this is sort of this iterative um, development of technologies that they're going to need for the moon landings, but they want to test it in a slightly less dangerous environment in orbit around the Earth instead of going all the way to the moon to test some things. Um, so Project Gemini, you have the first American spacewalk. Obviously, that's very important because if you want to walk around on the moon, you should be able to get out of your capsule and walk around. That was successful. Um, and then they had the first space rendezvous. So they launched um, Gemini 6 and 7 uh, separately, and then they came within about a foot of each other. They managed to find each other in space and get within a foot of each other. So that's that bottom left picture. And then the first space docking was Gemini 8. And it was a little dicey at times, but they did make it work. Um, and that's the um, Agena target vehicle in that middle picture that they docked to. And so, of course, this rendezvous and docking is also important for the moon missions because they have two different sh ships. And one of them is designed for landing on the moon, and one of them is designed for landing on Earth. And if you send people down to the moon and they come up and they can't get to the ship to land on Earth, that's obviously a problem. So it was very important that they got all this stuff figured out with Project Gemini. And after Gemini, they moved on to Apollo, and they put, they put the first man on the moon. There were actually six missions which landed on the moon, and they did win the space race. They did put the first person on the moon before the Soviet Union. So that was a very big success. Um, I want to take a side note here and just point out that that little tiny triangle at the top inside that circle, that's where the astronauts were. Um, so it, this is this huge rocket which takes a whole bunch of work just to put that tiny, tiny capsule in space. And that kind of has a parallel with some computer science stuff because if any of you have ever built like even a small app, you've probably like noticed how much back end it takes just to have a teeny little bit of user interface functionality. So I just think that's a little like interesting thing. It's like it takes a lot just to get a little bit to happen. Um, and so after Apollo, you know, they put six people, six missions on the moon, and then 
there was a little bit of a sag in public interest because, okay, we've done this, what's next? And so about 10 years later, they get the space shuttle back. It's a little less urgent because they're not trying to beat anyone to anything. So in the 1980s, they start off the space shuttle. First reusable spacecraft, which is very exciting. Um, the only reusable part is the orbiter, so that's the like part that looks like a plane. Uh, the two white rockets on either side and then the orange tank, those were all disposable. Those would burn up uh, after they jettisoned uh, for the most part. Um, and so even though it was only partially reusable, it was obviously a big step to all of the reusable rockets we see today where they're landing them on like aircraft carrier, like, like boats and stuff, like, I don't know. This is the first step. Um, and now we're on to Artemis. Uh, the space shuttle ran for 30 years, and then they decided, okay, let's move on to something else. So now we're on Artemis. Hopefully a lot of you know about Artemis, but I'll go into some, uh, a little bit about it just so everyone's on the same page. So it launched, the first Artemis mission launched last November. Uh, and like Gemini, it's kind of following the same um, like iterative crawl walk run, crawl walk run uh, idea, which is Artemis is going to the moon, but that's not the end goal, right? Artemis wants to go to Mars. So just like Gemini was using uh, Earth's orbit as this testing ground for technologies for the moon, Artemis is hoping to use the moon as this testing ground for technologies for Mars. So hopefully we'll be seeing some Mars missions in the not too distant future, but. We'll see. Uh, there are, you know, after, after this, who knows, right? We'll put people on Mars, hopefully we won't leave them behind. Um, I, we could go to other galaxies, I don't know. Like, it'll take a while, but the possibilities are there, you know? Like, it'd be pretty cool. And that's why I like aerospace engineering, it's like, this stuff is cool. Like, <laughs> Okay, so that, that was our overview. And so just so you have a little bit of an idea of how the rest of the presentation is gonna go, we're gonna go really deep into three of the missions that we just talked about, and one additional one, which we'll get into later. Um, all of the sections from this point forward are either gonna be parallels or lessons learned. Uh, Apollo will be both. But so again, or sorry, parallels or intersections. So parallels, again, being what can we learn to apply to computer science? And the intersection being, how do we put computers in space? What are the considerations? And we're going to start off looking at Artemis. So <clears throat> we're going to look at the at the parallels. What what can we learn from what's been going on with Artemis, and how can we apply that uh, to computer science projects? And with Artemis, I mean, for a long time, people were really skeptical about Artemis. And I actually had to change my slides as I was working on them because Artemis finally launched. So it changed a, a bit. Um, but for a long time, there was a lot of skepticism. And the SLS, which is the space launch system that's the rocket that Artemis is going to launch on, it was kind of this like, ha ha, never going to happen. You know, it's chronically over over budget, behind schedule, never gonna happen. Um, one of my aerospace professors at the end of lecture, she would open up the floor to questions and she'd say, okay, does anyone have any questions? But don't ask me what Artemis is gonna launch because no one knows that. Um, and the plan with Artemis was, they started the program in 2011 as they were kind of retiring the space shuttle and they planned to have the first launch five years later. And six years after that, they had the first launch. So there were a lot of delays. And for a lot of a lot of time, if you look at the public opinion between 2016 and 2022 when it, when it finally launched, it seemed like everyone thought it was a waste of time, waste of money, waste of resources. There's no plan. It's billions over budget. What are you doing, NASA? You know, like. This public opinion is, was that NASA was creating something that was completely worthless, pretty much. And then we get kind of closer. 
we get to 2022, and they're they're rolling it out to the launch pad. They're trying to launch this thing. And of course, rolling it out to the launch pad is not a small task. So like if they're rolling it out to the launch pad, like they got some confidence. So it's like, okay, there's some hope. Um, and then there was a few leak in September. And they said, okay, we know we have this fuel leak. We think we can fix it by October, and the moon will be in the right position. So they said, okay, October. We're going to launch it in October. Uh, that didn't quite happen. But they said, okay, <laughs> November. We're going to launch it in November. Uh, and then there was a hurricane, so that made it hard. But finally, um, but I mean, this made sense. It was like, as you all know, 80% of the project takes 80% of the time, and then the other 20% of the project takes the other 80% of the time. So, <laughs> but they keep they keep updating their plan. They keep telling us, okay, here's here's our plan. We have a plan. And so that's a really big positive. And finally, end of November, it flew. And it's this really amazing, like beautiful rocket. Yeah. Awesome, right? And it, before it flew, it's a waste of time. Why are you doing this? This is awful. You're just spending money and not accomplishing anything. But it flies, and people are like, "Wow! Like we can be proud of this. This is awesome. This is this, you know, beautiful rocket. It's going to take people to the moon." Like they they delivered on their promises, and now it's something that's given us as the stakeholders, the American people, this this value. So. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about a different side of this sort of idea of shipping the product, getting the product uh, where it needs to be. And this applies, especially in aerospace engineering, where you might have some more internal logistics to the project. So the Orion capsule is the uh, it's on top of the space launch system, so the space launch system, the rocket, and then the capsule on top of it is where the people will be, and all of that together is Artemis. And the Orion capsule, they had to take it, all, the way NASA set up, there's different testing facilities all over the country with different capabilities, and they needed to bring it right here to Sandusky, Ohio, to test uh, the Orion capsule. But it was in Florida at the time. so. They have this really awesome plane called the Super Guppy <laughs> that they put the capsule in and fly it all the way to Ohio. Uh, this is actually the third iteration of the Guppy plane. The first one was designed to fly around Saturn V parts, so parts of the Apollo rocket. Um, and now we've got this one. Um, if this plane didn't exist or NASA didn't have access to it, they would have needed to plan ahead because otherwise they wouldn't have been able to get the testing done that they were supposed to get done with this capsule and say that's like i don't know how else you get this massive somewhat delicate capsule to say dusky like it seems important to plan ahead for that and they did um and so this is another example um of the fact that shipping is a feature and what we mean by this is first Product is useless if it's never shipped to the customer. So don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. A perfect product that has all the features and no bugs and the customer never gets, why'd you build it, right? If the, if the SLS had been perfect and never launched, why'd you build it? What was the point? Um, and so once it became, once the SLS became turned from a chronically over budget project to a chronically over budget but successful product, it was the change in public opinion was pretty pretty impressive. The second thing that we mean when we talk about um, shipping as a feature is that logistical considerations for testing facilities, manufacturing capabilities, etc., should be taken into account so that those processes can be executed smoothly. Um, so if you're designing a website and you're like, okay, it's going to get a million hits per day, you should have some evidence to back that up. But if this is your belief that you're building this really cool website and everyone's going to want to visit it, it's going to have 
so many hits per day is going to be really, really, really popular. Assuming you have evidence to back that up, you should also have a plan in place to test for that before you launch the website and a million people hit it and it crashes. So that's similar to how NASA had the Super Guppy and they knew that they were going to be able to use this test facility and they were going to be able to get everything to the test facility and it was all pretty well planned out. The other thing that I want to talk about is updating the plan. So like we talked about, NASA has been really, really good, especially in the later phase of as they were ready to launch and it just kept getting delayed by a little bit. They've been really good about telling us why it was delayed and saying, okay, we have a plan. We're gonna fix it by X date. The moon will be in the right position by X date. So we can launch it at X date. And yes, that date did keep changing, but as it changed, they told us. And it's important to be able to update the plan because just continuing to work on a project and saying that, you know, okay, it didn't get done today, maybe tomorrow. Like, if, it, if it's delayed, there's probably a reason. And if you know the reason, you can fix it. So having an updated plan takes into account that reason generally and allows you to actually address it and fix the project. Um, an estimate is a guess. The, the new date is a guess, but it should hopefully be informed by a plan, and the plan will help you actually finish the project, and that's, that's the value of the plan. So that was Artemis. Uh, we're going to take a step back in time and look at the space shuttle. And in this section, we're going to look at some of those intersections. So what are the considerations of putting computers in space? Uh, the space shuttle was used to launch a lot of satellites, so we're going to use this section to talk about how those satellites and their electronics are affected by existing in space. So the space shuttle, by volume, carried a lot of cargo. That, that bit at the front, like the cockpit area, that's like where the astronauts were able to live and work. That big cargo bay in the back was a lot of the volume of the space shuttle, and they were able to get some pretty big satellites in there. Like, hopefully you all know the name, the Hubble Space Telescope. That was launched off of the space shuttle. Um, and if you don't recognize the name Hubble Space Telescope, hopefully you recognize some pictures. Um, <clears throat> I mainly include this slide just so that I can showcase another reason I love aerospace engineering, which is, wow, those are pretty, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. So Hubble, Hubble's amazing, it's really impactful, it's been very prolific, it, these, these are some amazing images and these are like a very small subset. So if you don't know Hubble, go look up Hubble and look at some more pictures. But Hubble's in space and the thing about space is it's not very nice to people or computers. Um, and it's a little bit susceptible to radiation from the sun. And the sun, as you can see in this very definitely to scale image, <laughs> it throws radiation in all directions. It's constantly throwing off radiation. Luckily, here on Earth, we have this beautiful magnetic shield, and it protects us from the radiation. So that's really cool, because otherwise we probably wouldn't be here. So we're very happy that we have a magnetic shield, or a magnetic field. Um, and as computers and electronics have gotten more complex, they've gotten more susceptible to errors caused by radiation. And while we do have this magnetic field, there is a side effect to it, uh, which is that some of those high energy radiation particles get trapped in what's called the Van Allen belts. So you've got these two belts of, that are just kind of chock full of high energy particles that are very bad for computers. Um, the inner belt is mainly protons, the outer belt is mainly electrons, but what you need to know is you don't want those to hit your computer. Um, here's another picture of the Van Allen belts, kind of a slightly different um, angle and some more detail. And what I want you to notice is the two axes. There's the rotational axis and the magnetic axis. axis. And they're slightly off kilter from each other. And they're also not exactly aligned in the center. Those Center points are a little bit offset. 
And what that does is that causes the Van Allen belt to not be perfectly set around the Earth. So the inner radiation belt comes really, really close to the Earth um, in a region that's called the South Atlantic Anomaly because it's over the South Atlantic. It's good at aiming things. <laughs> and when satellites pass through this area, that's, that's the blue area, uh, it, it's not good for them. So they have to take some mitigation measures if they're going to have an orbit that passes through that area. So for example, Hubble uh, spends about 15% of its time passing through the South Atlantic Anomaly. And they actually turn it off when it does that because that allows the, light, the electronics to not be so susceptible to the radiation. Uh, and yes, that's 15% of the time that it's not taking pretty pictures, but if they didn't do that, it probably wouldn't be up there right now. It would probably have failed somewhere along the way. So taking those mitigation measures, really important. Um, one example of why we really want to do that is the Hitomi Space Telescope. Uh, this is an X-ray telescope. It's, uh, Hitomi is Japanese for um, pupil of the eye. And it was designed to, you know, look at all this very cool faraway stuff and get a lot of data. But what happened was shortly after it was launched, it passed through the South Atlantic Anomaly. And what they think happened is it experienced what's called a single event upset, which is basically high energy particle hits the computer or some piece of electronics and it flips a bit. So zero to one, one to zero. Um, and what that caused in the case of Tony was one of the sensors kept telling the computer, we're rolling. And the computer said, well, we don't want to do that. Hard to take pictures when you're rolling. Probably not a good idea. We should stop that. So the computer put some thrust on to do a counter torque and get it to stop rolling. Um, but it wasn't rolling. And the sensor kept saying, we're rolling, we're rolling. And the computer was like, okay, okay. And it tumbled out of control and the solar panel sheared off and it, they completely lost contact with it. So even though they had some mitigation measures in place, they got unlucky. And this is why we take the South Atlantic Anomaly so seriously is, this is a pretty major product, project and it lasted two months. So that, that's why we really want to take that seriously if we're putting computers in the orbit around here. <coughs> And another example um, of a computer that's been affected, or a satellite that's been affected by the South Atlantic Anomaly is the Calypso satellite. So during my interview uh, with NASA this summer and then throughout the school year, I've been working uh, on the Calypso satellite. And it was launched in 2006, and its electronics, like other electronics, are susceptible to radiation. And Calypso has this really cool laser that it uses to collect data on clouds and aerosols in the atmosphere. And while the computer is very well shielded from radiation, the laser isn't as much. And so what you can see from this chart is each of those dots is a time when they tried to fire the laser and it wasn't up to the energy that they expected because they need a certain amount of energy to get the data they need. Um, so the purple, the red, the gray, those are very high energy drops. They barely get anything out of the laser. The other colors are a little bit of an energy drop, not quite so bad. And that yellow outline is the South Atlantic anomaly. <laughs> so yes, there are anomalies elsewhere. There's still radiation elsewhere above the Earth, but really big problem right there. And that causes a lot of the issues that Calypso has had with the laser. Uh, and so this is just a really good example of how impactful the South Atlantic Anomaly is on spacecraft electronics. So what? Um, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, the South Atlantic Anomaly, would uh, something like, say, cell phone service be poor in that portion of the Earth, or is that something that wouldn't be affected by that? Um, if it was satellite-based, Possibly. Um, I don't really know. Sorry. 
Is it the Bermuda Triangle or space? Um, no. 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 They, they do call it the Bermuda Triangle of space sometimes. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, so what can we do, right? <clears throat> uh, one of the main things is voting or redundancy. So, if you have one computer and it has a single event upset and it gives you the wrong data, you don't know. If you have three computers and two of them give you the same answer and one of them gives you a different answer, the two are probably right. It would be really impressive if you had two different pieces of radiation hit two different computers in like the same spot and pulled the same bit in the same way, get the same wrong answer. <laughs> so, so if, if you if you have three computers, you can you can usually defend against the the the, the effects of the radiation in that in that way. Uh, in aerospace engineering, though, we usually are trying to cut down weight. Like, that's our biggest factor all the time is less weight, less weight, because it takes a lot of fuel to get even a little bit of weight in space. So we try to avoid more weight, and obviously sending three times as many computers, not as good, but it is an option depending on the application. Uh, another thing that we'll do sometimes is uh, SRAM or DRAM. So SRAM is static RAM. And, that, and DRAM is dynamic RAM. And so SRAM is a little bit more complex, a little more expensive, um, but it's really good. It's a lot less susceptible to single event upsets than DRAM, and so that's why static RAM is often chosen in satellites, but again, it depends on the application, and there's a lot of other factors. Uh, another big one um, is feature size. So that refers like to the size of the components like on the circuit board for the computer. And if you have a computer here on Earth, it probably has a feature size on the order of five nanometers. And if you have a smaller feature size, it's going to be more susceptible to the radiation. Because if you have the, the memory stored on a bigger piece of area, a bigger piece of computer, it's a lot harder, takes more energy in the radiation to flip that bit. So that's why Perseverance rover has a feature size on the order of 200 nanometers. Yes, we have the technology to make it smaller, but it, there's not a lot of magnetic field on Mars. You've got to be able to have the rover keep working, so they have the feature size be bigger. And again, you still have the weight trade-offs in that way, and you can't make it as complex as a computer because the feature size is bigger, but it works, and that's, that's what we care about. So this all kind of feeds in, I know that this was an intersection section and not a parallel section, but we are going to talk a little bit about a programming principle, which is, you know, you want to keep things <laughs> stupid simple. <laughs> so if you have fewer points of failure, there's fewer ways to fail, it's a more robust system. And so if you, if you want to press that button on the computer, you press, press the button, right? Like, don't, don't build the Rube Goldberg machine. Just, just press the button. That's all you gotta do. So, in an aerospace application, I would want to make a more simple system so that it can't break in as many ways. In a program, I would want to write a simpler program so that it can't break in as many ways. And so, keep things simple so that they can't break as well. All right. Next. So we looked at the space shuttle, and we're actually going to do one more thing related to the space shuttle, which is one of the things, in addition to satellites, that the space shuttle helped launch was the International Space Station. They launched up many of the modules of the ISS uh, with the space shuttle. And so we're going to look a little bit at the ISS. And in this section, we're going to go back to the parallel. So what can we learn about how the ISS was designed, and how can we apply that to computer science? So the ISS, the first module, was launched in 1998, and people started living there in 2000, and people have been living there continuously ever since. And we've learned a lot. It's been a really successful example of international collaboration in space. 
it, overall, it's just been this really amazing thing. And it's a really good example of the modularity that you can achieve with aerospace systems. Uh, so aerospace is trying to work towards more modularity in most cases. Uh, we're not going to talk about the aircraft side of things. It's it's harder to get modular uh, modular modularity with aircraft. Um, maybe it's a matter of time, but aer aerodynamics make that hard. So we're going to go out into Earth's atmosphere so that we can be a little bit more modular. So this is how satellites used to be made, and some of them still are. Um, <clears throat> I want to put a camera in space to take pictures of her. So I'm going to get my camera, line my camera so that it goes into space well, it's protected from radiation, all that stuff. Um, I'm going to need some solar panels, some batteries, uh, communications probably so I can get those pictures back. Maybe some thrusters because if I launch it and it's facing straight up, I can't take pictures of very many hurricanes, so I should probably have some <laughs> thrusters so I can turn it. Um, I need a rocket, I should probably go find one of those. <clears throat> I gotta design all these things, I gotta wire them all together, I gotta create this bus sized satellite and stick it on a rocket and launch it up to space. So that's how we used to do it, and sometimes still do, but we're trying to move away from that. And <clears throat> we're trying to move away from that because that's an anti pattern. Right? If one thing breaks, it all breaks, it's all wired together. I have to design all of it myself, which I care about the camera. I don't what's all this other stuff, right? So, so similarly, if you're building a program, it's better to have different things in different places. Because if one thing breaks and that just means everything breaks, how do you know what broke? <clears throat> so if I just build the satellite and it doesn't work, how do I know why? <clears throat> and one of the things that we need to do <clears throat> in order to have some modularity is we need to design good interfaces. <clears throat> so Legos, Legos are a good example of an interface uh, because you have a couple circles, a uh, certain radius and a certain distance apart, and you've got another thing <clears throat> with an interface on the bottom, and you can stick them together and you can build anything. So that's a really good interface. It's a very, uh, it's a very wide interface. It works for a lot of things. You can build whatever you want, and sometimes that's good. In a lot of cases, you want a really inclusive interface like that. Sometimes you might want a more exclusive interface. So, as you all know, Apple recently moved from USB-C or from Lightning to USB-C for charging their products. And as a consumer, this is great for me. I want this more inclusive USB-C interface because I can plug my iPhone into that. I can plug my Nintendo Switch into that. I can like there's so many things that I can use that interface for, and I can carry around one cord. So for me, on my side of things, that's great. I want that more inclusive interface. But on the other side, on the producer side of things, you want, obviously, the more exclusive interface. The lightning cable was great for Apple. They could sell the lightning cable, and you had to buy that, and you had to carry that around, and you can only use it for your Apple devices. And it worked well for them. So depending on what kind of interface you're trying to design, you need to consider whether you want that interface to fit better with more things or to only fit with one specific thing. So if I'm trying to create a module for a program and I want to be able to switch it in and out to get different functionality, then I'd probably have a more inclusive interface. But if I have something and I just want to stick two things together and hopefully not have to deal with it ever again, then it could be a more you know custom uh, exclusive interface just for those two things. Um, and so now, now that we've figured out these interfaces and stuff, aerospace is moving to CubeSats. So I just have to build a satellite. I can take my, um, I can take my camera and put it in this little CubeSat. It's probably got some standard solar panels, some standard communications, 
And then I can go to a big space company and I can say, hey, I got a cube, it's got a camera in it. And I'll say, hey, big space company, you have a rocket, you got some empty space there, can I have a seat? And big space company will say, yes, give me some money and I'll take your satellite and I'll put it in space. And I'll say, great. And everyone wins. Now I have my satellite in space. I didn't have to build a huge bus size satellite and it's, it was a lot cheaper. So it's expensive to put things in space, but a whole lot cheaper to put a little cube than this huge satellite for the same functionality. So this, this modularity, this standardization is, has been really good for aerospace. And of course, that's something that we work towards in computer science as well. And another reason that modularity is a good way to go for aerospace is there's kind of this idea of the moon not just as this technological stepping point towards Mars, like Artemis is using it for, this like technological proving ground, but in the future, once we've proved the technology, what if the moon is a logistical stepping point to Mars? You know, I launch my rocket and I, I'm gonna orbit the moon and then I'm gonna head off to Mars. Um, and let's say, you know, I run out of fuel, I get a flat tire on my way to, my, on my way to the moon, and, you know, I gotta fix these things. So, probably not a flat tire, um, but, you know, maybe a micrometeorite hits my solar panel, smashes it completely. I can go to the solar repair, solar panel repair guy on the moon and say, can I have another solar panel? And there will be this standard interface on my rocket, and I'll unplug my damaged solar panel, and I'll plug in the new one, and I'll refuel, and I'll head off to Mars. So if we can get this modularity, if we can get this, also the standardization of the interfaces in aerospace, then we can get this future. And so if this is a future that we want to work towards, that's that modularity, that standardization is something that in aerospace we're going to be working towards a lot more in the future. And so going back to the ISS, it's really modular. They've got all these cool things. They've got different modules, and you've got different purposes for each module. You've got science modules. You've got an exercise module. You can do anything that you need to do in the ISS. And everything has its own place. And it, it's organized. It works well. And <clears throat> another thing with the ISS that I think makes it really, really impressive is it was made by five different space agencies and more than that, different countries. And a lot of the modules of the ISS were built different countries all over the earth and then they never came anywhere near each other until they were in space ready to put them together. And the interfaces were well communicated and well designed and they fit together like perfectly and now we've got this this huge international collaboration where we've created this beautiful space station where everything was built by different countries and they still managed to communicate their interfaces between each other well enough to make this really cool thing that fit together. Because in space, it's, it's good if the interfaces fit together because you know, if they don't fit together, then you have a leak, and then there's no pressure in the space station, and then you can't breathe. So it's very good, very good that they got those interfaces very well communicated and very well fit together. <clears throat> and the idea um, of having the modules with all the different purposes feeds into the principle of separation of concerns. Um, if you use an airlock for storage, you're gonna lose things. Uh, so if we go back, if you think about Gemini, where there was the picture of the guy floating outside the spacecraft, he, um, they kinda used the whole capsule as an airlock because they didn't have a lot of space. And so when he went outside, that one of the videos you can see like a glove just floating off into space because it wasn't secured properly and they were using the capsule as an airlock. They didn't separate their concerns and they lost stuff. And 
If you use your fridge to store bleach, please don't. <laughs> um, it, it'll be gross, don't do that. Um, and if you use your front end code to store plumbing code, it's gonna be harder to read, harder to deal with, harder to debug, it's just gonna be problematic all around. So separate your concerns, don't put bleach in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you take nothing else away from this talk, don't put <laughs> <laughs> Bonus tip. Um, another, another principle that feeds into this idea of modularity of the International Space Station is the dependency inversion principle. And with the dependency inversion principle, the basic idea is modules should depend on interfaces rather than implementation. So let's say, you know, I, I want an Xbox, right? I, I want to be able to sit at home, play on my Xbox. Sounds like fun. Some cool games, so I'm going to try some out. So I'm going to go to the store, buy an Xbox, bring it home, unwrap it, set it up, get out my soldering kit, pull some wires out of the wall, <laughs> take the Xbox, the cord, and I'm going to solder that into the wall. And then I'm going to get my TV, right? There's a, like some wires in the back of the TV, and there's a wire from the Xbox. I'm soldering those together. Um, and now I can play on my Xbox. That's great. That's how all of you do it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Um, and then let's say, you know, I have some little brothers. Let's say I invite them over to come play in my living room, and they're throwing a ball around. And the ball hits my brand new Xbox. And I have to get a new Xbox. So I go to the store, I bring my Xbox home, and I get out my soldering kit, and I unsolder the first Xbox from the wall, and I unsolder it from the TV, and I, you know, get rid of it, get my new Xbox, solder it to the wall, solder it to the TV, and it's all set up. It was great. Like, that worked so well. Um, hopefully none of you knew that. Um, don't do that either. <clears throat> No bleach in the fridge, and don't solder things into the wall. Um, but really, like, obviously that's not how we do it. We have, you know, we got an HDMI cord from the Xbox, and it's the standard interface, and it plugs into the back of the TV. And then we got the little two-pronged cord, and as long as we're in America with that same interface, we plug it into the wall, and it works. And then if my Xbox breaks, I unplug it from the wall, or if I need to plug in a lamp for a few minutes, I plug that into the, I unplug and plug in, like, that works a whole lot better. That's, that's a much better system. <clears throat> and what that means is that I don't have to care what the wires look like behind my wall. <clears throat> I can buy an Xbox without having to go look at the blueprints for my house and figure out where to stick things in the wall. There's an interface. I know that it will provide me power, so I plug it in and I trust it to work. So <clears throat> in, in code, you build an interface and you don't tell anyone how it works in the back end. You don't tell the other modules because they don't care. As long as you do what you promise, it generally is going to work out fine. So the interface has a promise. And the other modules that depend on it believe that promise, and they fit together, and the code runs. And if that module, you want to switch it out for some reason, you build another module with the same interface, and you plug it right in. <clears throat> so that's, that's the dependency inversion principle. And that's the International Space Station. So we're going to take another step back in time and we're going to look at Apollo. And unlike previous sections, this section is going to look both at intersections and parallels. And we're going to start off with the intersections. So with Apollo 1, or sorry, with the parallels. With Apollo 1, we're going to look at what can we learn about project management, what can we learn about um, software from Apollo 1. And then with Apollo 11, we're going to look at the, like putting the computers in space. So Apollo 1 was a really sad day in American space flight. It was 
really the first time that American astronauts died on the job. It was not meant to be a launch or anything. It was what's called a plugs out test, which was basically a dress rehearsal for the launch. It was considered not dangerous at all because it was just a test. They didn't think anything could go wrong. And things did. Um, and so three astronauts, Gus, <clears throat> sorry, Gus Grissom, Ed, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee uh, died that day. And what NASA did is that bottom picture, they completely took apart the capsule, trying to figure out what went wrong trying to make sure that this could never, ever happen again. They found as much as they could as to what went wrong and how they could prevent that. And one of the biggest things that they found was sort of related to insufficient testing and not testing in the right environments. Um, and so what happened was the, the capsule was pressurized with pure oxygen because at the time, there were some technology considerations. First of all, the weight considerations of trying to build the, the plumbing and stuff for a two gas atmosphere would have been kind of complicated. And there were worries about having nitrogen in the atmosphere affect the astronauts um, in bad ways just because of how it would have been wired up. Um, so they, they went with pure oxygen. And fire needs oxygen to burn. And things in a pure oxygen atmosphere burn really fast. But they tested, and they tested all the things that they were going to have in the capsule, and they planned when it was in space to pressurize the capsule to 5 psi. And they tested everything at 5 psi, uh, and it, it burned, but not at a speed that they thought was too dangerous. They thought, okay, if there's a fire at this speed of burning, we can put it out and it'll be okay. Um, but when they did the test on the ground, the, the capsule was pressurized to almost 17 psi because that was just kind of the standard procedure. And if you have the pressure difference between vacuum and 5 psi, you know, you want to minimize that pressure difference from a whole atmosphere in 17 psi instead of 5 psi, that made sure that there wasn't too much of a pressure difference. And they thought that that was an important <coughs> consideration. So that's why they pressurized it that high. Um, after the fact, though, when they tested uh, some of the materials at that 17 psi, they burned twice as fast. And that would have been determined to be an unsafe amount. And so with more testing, with more thorough reviews and such, trying to bring in more people to think of more possibilities, doing more testing to get all the edge cases, all the environments, it probably may maybe could have been prevented. Um, so this, this goes to show that, you know, in, in a safety critical system, test, 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 test. And yes, you go back to the don't let perfect be the enemy of the good, shipping as a feature, make sure the thing actually launches, uh, but it's a balance. And this is a case where the balance went the wrong way. So in a less safety critical system, it's less important, but in a safety critical system, test, 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 test. Um, on a lighter note, uh, Apollo 11, once they figured out the problems with Apollo 1, they made changes to the capsule to make it safer. Um, Apollo 11 was a very big success. Um, so about two years later, they launched people to the moon, and Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked around on the moon and <clears throat> won the space race. And so this was really successful, and it would not have been possible without computers. So <clears throat> the computer that made it possible, there were several, but this is the big one, was the Apollo Guidance computer. There were actually two. There was one on the Apollo capsule, the, the command module, and one on the lunar uh, landing capsule. And I mean, looking at it right now, it doesn't look like much. It's this little, like, this was cutting edge technology. This was, that, that interface was like cutting edge, you know. Astronauts had to memorize, it was a, it was a verb noun interface, so combinations of verbs and nouns would lead to different commands, and the computer would run whatever program that um, 
told them told it to run. And so the astronauts have to memorize which numbers went to which commands and type things into the into that interface there. Um, so this is a really cool computer. It's really well documented, and you can actually play with like a it's apparently pretty accurate like simulators online like of this computer. So check that out if you're interested. Um, and another really uh, interesting thing about this computer is it had what's called ferret core memory, um, and they were actually manufactured by former textile workers because the a lot of stuff was like literally hardwired into the computer. They how the wires were woven through the computer, like they, they, what the programs were. Um, so I, I just think this is really cool. Like we don't really do this today. Like but this this was cutting edge technology. This was robust. This was it was you know really well designed. It worked very well. And so the 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 computer guided the astronauts all the way to the moon and there were some things so it it got the most of the way there but it couldn't do everything uh at that time because as you see the train was very rocky um and actually due to some like gravitational things about the moon they didn't understand at the time they actually went farther than they meant to um and so they were landing in not quite the right spot and it was very rocky and the computer <coughs> didn't have you know all the great sensors and stuff and it wasn't like you know auto driving itself down to the moon sensing everything it was just like you told me to go here so i'm going here um and so neil armstrong had to take the wheel and avoid some of those craters you see over there and land in that nice flat zone over there but without computers they wouldn't have gotten that close like space is big and they didn't land all that far from where they meant to land. So that's really impressive that they had the, that they were able to do that, and it was all because they had the computers. <clears throat> all right, so that was Apollo. And so now we've looked, we've looked from Mercury all the way to whatever the future might hold. And we've gone in depth into for uh, the missions, and hopefully uh, you've taken away some of these principles. Um, hopefully, you know, as you go off and build amazing things, some of the aerospace anecdotes I've shared will help you remember some of these principles um, and apply them, hopefully. Uh, don't put bleach in the fridge. <laughs> and um, yeah, thank you. So I'll open up to questions.